program entitled Reparations, Reconciliation, and HR 40. Um, I think most of the people in the group are part of the Facing Racism group, but just for the background, uh, this program was put on um, by Leah, Mike, and myself, who, are, who make up the social action uh, subgroup of the Facing Racism group. Um, at, at St. Seb's and St. Catharines. We're really happy that you all uh, joined us um, for tonight's discussion. Uh, the purpose of tonight's discussion is to um, under, explore the idea of reparations, connect that to the idea of the Sacrament of Reconciliation, and um, understand some legislation that's uh, before Congress um, and maybe take some action. Um, Neither Leah nor Mike nor myself are experts in any way in, in this subject matter. Um, we are people who have been searching in our own lives for um, a way to enact racial justice. And this is simply one of the many possible ways that we have found that. So um, hopefully tonight is an, a, uh, a night of dialogue um, and learning for all people. So um, before we start with prayer, I'm gonna just have each of the people in the social action group introduce themselves. So again, my name is Chris Dwyer. I'm a St. Sebastian's parishioner and I live in the Washington Heights neighborhood. Uh, and I've lived here for about four or five years. So Mike. Um, hi everybody, Mike Duffy. And uh, we've been a member of St. Sebastian's for a long time. Um, and uh, we were over the border, 71st Street in Tulsa but a long time member of SEBS. Leah? Yeah, my name's Leah Seeley. I've been at SEBS for about 20 years now. Um, sent my kids to school through St. SEBS and working as a practicing spiritual director now. Um, I am going to introduce a, a prayer that I uh, wrote inspired by Father Brian Massengill's racism is a sickness of the soul. Is, but before we go on, can everybody see the screen with that prayer up? Just started a. Uh... Yes. Okay. And we'd also like to remind you, you know, when you're not speaking, if you could just mute your screen so we don't get any background noise, that would be great. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Loving, merciful God, there are few issues that grip and affect us emotionally more than the issue of race. People we know or who we have only read about have suffered because of the color of their skin. This has been the case long before we got here, but it has affected every aspect of how we live nonetheless. It is our faith that informs us to do what is just and right. It is our faith that propels us to run this leg of the race, to do our part, to do what we are supposed to do in order to hand the baton to someone else. Give me the strength to ask others to join me in this race for racial justice so that together we can create a new world and with God's help, heal, unite, and restore it what is now does not have to be. Therein lies our hope and challenge. Amen. 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 The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I'm going to just briefly uh, review what we're going to do this evening. Um, we're going to answer the question, why reparations? Talk about uh, HR 40 using a couple videos. We are going to compare um, reparations with the sacrament of reconciliation. And then we will break into small groups and kind of talk about how we see a connection in our own lives and talk about some of our own experiences. And then come back to the full group again. Um, in those small groups, we'll have a you know, a person that kind of organizes the team of, you know, maybe we'll have four people in the group. And then we'll have an invitation to action, like Chris said, that you can choose to do, and we could do that together. Um, and again, I'll remind you just to mute your microphones while we are in this um, 
this portion of the program. All right. Okay, there it is. Sorry, I was I was unmuting. Um, uh, so uh, I'm going to introduce this this short video. Um, I think if you're on this call in this Zoom meeting, then you don't need a long primer on or, or any kind of primer on the long history of systemic oppression of Black people in the United States. So the video we're about to show will will serve as a very short explanation of the need for reparations given the history of anti-Black racism in the USA. Uh, the video is of ta Coates' opening statement to a congressional hearing on this bill, H.R. 40, in the summer of 2019. The context of his remarks is that the day before, Senator Mitch McConnell expressed to the media a common response to the idea of reparations for slavery that nobody alive today perpetrated slavery. So it's not fair that we should have to pay for this sin. Um, and I'm not gonna say anything more. Uh, uh, it's the video is about five minutes. I will say that the volume is kind of low and I wanna just make sure that like yesterday, I am again, not experts here, um, I wanna make sure I am sharing my sound and I'm gonna play the video. Um, try as much as you can to turn the volume up. Uh, and if for whatever reason that doesn't work, I am putting in the chat, the link to the YouTube video now. So you'll see it on your screen, but if for whatever reason uh, it's not loud enough or something, I think the video is just kind of quiet, but the link is in the in the chat if, uh, for whatever reason, that is not working. So let Mr. Coates take it away from here. Yesterday, when asked about reparations, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell offered a familiar reply. America should not be held liable for something that happened 150 years ago, since none of us currently alive are responsible. This rebuttal proffers a strange theory of governance, that American accounts are somehow bound by the lifetime of its generations. But well into this century, the United States was still paying out pensions to the heirs of Civil War soldiers. We honor treaties that date back some 200 years, despite no one being alive who signed those treaties. Many of us would love to be taxed for the things we are solely and individually responsible for. But we are American citizens, and thus bound to a collective enterprise that extends beyond our individual and personal reach. It would seem ridiculous to dispute invocations of the founders or the greatest generation on the basis of a lack of membership in either group. We recognize our lineage as a generational trust, as inheritance. And the real dilemma posed by reparations is just that, a dilemma of inheritance. It is impossible to imagine America without the inheritance of slavery. As historian Ed Baptist has written, enslavement, quote, shaped every crucial aspect of the economy and politics of America, so that by 1836, more than 600 million, or almost half of the economic activity in the United States derived directly or indirectly from the cotton produced by the million odd slaves. By the time the enslaved were emancipated, they comprised the largest single asset in America, three billion and eighteen sixty dollars more than all the other assets in the country combined. The method of cultivating this asset was neither gentle cajoling nor persuasion, but torture, rape, and child trafficking. Enslavement reigned for two hundred and fifty years on these shores. When it ended, this country could have extended its hallowed principles, life, liberty the pursuit of happiness to all regardless of color. But America had other principles in mind. And so for a century after the Civil War, black people were subjected to a relentless campaign of terror, a campaign that extended well into the lifetime of Majority Leader McConnell. It is tempting to divorce this modern campaign of terror, of plunder, from enslavement. But the logic of enslavement, 
of white supremacy respects no such borders. And the god of bondage was lustful and begat many heirs, coup d'etats and convict leasing, vagrancy laws and debt peonage, redlining and racist GI bills, poll taxes and state-sponsored state terrorism. We grant that Mr. McConnell was not alive for Appomattox, but he was alive for the electrocution of George Stinney. He was alive for the blinding of Isaac Woodward. He was alive to witness kleptocracy in his native Alabama and a regime premised on electoral theft. Majority Leader McConnell cited civil rights legislation yesterday, as well he should, because he was alive to witness the harassment, jailing, and betrayal of those responsible for that legislation by a government sworn to protect them. He was alive for the redlining of Chicago and the looting of black homeowners of some $4 billion. Victims of that plunder are very much alive today. I am sure they'd love a word with the majority leader. What they know, what this committee must know, is that while emancipation dead bolted the door against the bandits of America, Jim Crow wedged the windows wide open. And that is the thing about Senator McConnell's something. It was 150 years ago, and it was right now. The typical black family in this country has one-tenth the wealth of the typical white family. Black women die in childbirth at four times the rate of white women. And there is, of course, the shame of this land of the free, boasting the largest prison population on the planet, of which the descendants of the enslaved make up the largest share. The matter of reparations is one of making amends and direct redress but it is also a question of citizenship. In H.R. 40, this body has a chance to both make good on its 2009 apology for enslavement and reject fair weather patriotism, to say that a nation is both its credits and its debits, that if Thomas Jefferson matters, so does Sally Hemings, that if D-Day matters, so does Black Wall Street, that if Valley Forge matters, so does Fort Pillow, because the question really is, not whether we will be tied to the somethings of our past, but whether we are courageous enough to be tied to the whole of them. Thank you. All right. So um, next. So again, that was. Uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, I think, sets the stage really well for why reparations uh, is something that is something important for us to consider. Um, this video is a little bit more about um, what H.R. 40, which is what he was testifying about, is all about. And again, reparations uh, is a term that I think a lot of people don't understand, and I think that's okay at this point. And I think there's not a lot of necessarily agreement about what reparations would be um, and the bill gets into that. And so I think this video next um, is, uh, is, a, is a good for us to take the next step in our understanding on it. So this is a piece on the history and current status of HR 40. Uh, it was produced in October, 2020. So just a few months ago, you'll hear uh, Mitch McConnell's comments, the statement that he made, and you'll also hear a clip of uh, Coates' testimony. So there's a little bit of repetitiveness, but it's about 10 minutes, and I think it gives a really good example about what we mean when we say HR 40, what we mean when we say reparations uh, to the descendants of slaves. So I will play this video now. And again, it's, it's another one that's a little bit quiet. So how is everybody sound uh, on this one? Everybody was okay? Okay, that's great. Um, I'm gonna mute myself and play the video. How do you calculate 200 years plus of brutality and murder uh, and violence uh, and the destruction of family and the lack of transfer of wealth? How do you calculate that? How do you calculate that for the descendants of enslaved Africans? Conversations about the damages caused by the enslavement of black people and the discriminatory and racist policies that came after emancipation are not new. But as the U.S. continues to reckon with racial injustice, there's a renewed push to figure out how reparations can become a reality. 
I think we're at a moment when the nation knows it cannot continue any longer without addressing the original sin, not my neighbor, not uh, my fellow Texan, but the United States government that sanctioned this horrific act and continued disparities against the descendants of enslaved Africans, Black Americans, African Americans, from redlining to denial of loans. This is Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. She served as the representative for Texas's 18th district since 1995. Congresswoman Jackson Lee is the main sponsor of a bill which is meant to address reparations on a national scale. It's called HR 40. What it says is that we will establish this appointed by uh, the leaders of the House and Senate and the President of the United States, and we will provide a vast opportunity for data collection and witnesses and testimony and going around the nation and finding out how do you address this question? Basically, the bill establishes a commission that would create national reparations proposals that focus on which African Americans should be paid and how. The body of a young girl was found this morning in the woods. Sorry for the ads. The creators of the bill say it's the first of its kind to address slavery directly at a national level. Some communities are saying, well, we want to pay reparations, so here's a jobs bill. Well, no, that's maybe good public policy, maybe necessary, maybe important, but it's not reparations. That's Dr. Ron Daniels. He's the president and founder of the Institute of the Black World 21st Century and the convener of the National African American Reparations Commission. He's been part of the fight to pass H.R. 40 for decades. H.R. 40 strikes at the heart, the essence of structural institutional racism in these United States of America. But critics of the bill have often taken issue with the perceived cost and what they say is a complicated process. Putting aside the injustice of monetary reparations from current taxpayers for the sins of a small subset of Americans from many generations ago, the, let me finish. The fair distribution of reparations would be nearly impossible once one considers the complexity of the American struggle to abolish slavery. I, I don't think reparations for something that happened 150 years ago for whom none of us currently living are responsible is a good idea. Uh, we've you know, tried to deal with our original sin of slavery by fighting a civil war, by passing uh, landmark civil rights legislation elected an African-American president. But remember, this bill for reparations isn't just about what took place during slavery. It's also about the racially discriminatory and exclusionary policies that took place after emancipation. We have to get people to understand what we're talking about. It's not an indictment of individuals, even though we obviously have some people who are individually hateful and prejudiced and racist in their behavior. Uh, but we're talking about much more than that. We're talking about something bigger than that in terms of having people understand that we are where we are today in this country because of this historical tragedy that occurred. But despite the critics, Jackson Lee says support for the bill has begun to increase. When it was first introduced in 1989, the bill garnered 24 co-sponsors. As of October 2020, the bill currently has 157. All of the co-sponsors are within the Democratic Party. I believe this moment in history where the racial divide is being uh, stoked um, and more people are throwing gasoline on fire, I think we all are trying to find a way where we can link arms and have Congress in some way be part of the solution. And certainly the lynching, the public lynching of George Floyd and the, soul, the pandemic of, of, of racial racialized murders by state-sponsored actors, I mean, it's, it's, it has birthed this huge movement under the auspices of Black Lives Matter. But it wasn't always like that. Reparations is a centuries-old movement in the U.S. In fact, H.R. 40 draws its name from the very first form of reparations for slavery in the U.S., which was introduced in January of 1865, before the Civil War even ended. So 
was the idea from General Sherman to take 400,000 uh, acres and to divide it with 40 acres and a mule. And for people to understand, that was money, that was wealth. That was giving 40 acres and mobility. A mule was mobility. And that was, in essence, to say we were at fault. Uh, this was heinous. Uh, this was horrible. Uh, this was brutal. And this is a response to that. But the order was stopped when Andrew Johnson took office after Abraham Lincoln's assassination. Rather than grant the 40 acres and a mule, Johnson gave land back to its former Confederate owners. And formerly enslaved people were never given their payments. This one's the perfect gift for the friend who's been getting a little too comfortable during quarantine. Maybe your son, a father. Over a century went by, and in 1989, Congressman John Conyers introduced the first version of H.R. 40 to Congress. Keep in mind that this was just a year after Japanese Americans were granted reparations for being forced into internment camps during World War II. You're always going to hear members of Congress tell you we can't afford it, that the time isn't right, that there are a thousand reasons why this should not be done right now. That's John Tateishi. He was at the forefront of the fight for Japanese-American reparations. I mean, everyone told me that this is doomed to failure. Don't do it. And it's an impossibility. And it was. I mean, I knew that it was an impossibility because no one had ever done this, not at this scale. And so I knew trying to achieve this was going to be an impossible challenge. But, you know, my feeling was, well, we'll take it as far as we can. Tateishi says he and Conyers discussed reparations for slavery during H.R. 40's creation, and says Conyers initially intended for the bill to address the lost reparations of 1865. But support for reparations for the brutality of enslaving Africans in the U.S. was small in the late 1980s. So instead, the bill served as an introduction to the topic. As a member of the Judiciary Committee, the first African-American on the House Judiciary Committee in its history, it became very clear that as we struggle with the questions of civil rights, affirmative action, equality of opportunity, uh, there must be some historical cognition on our part about the whole question of reparations. In the meantime, several people across the country took to suing the national government for reparations with mixed levels of success. And Presidents Bill Clinton and George W. Bush acknowledged the atrocities of slavery in statements that received mixed responses across the country. On June 18, 2009, the 111th Congress issued a statement apologizing for the impacts of the institution of slavery and Jim Crow era laws on black communities in the US. And in 2017, HR 40 transitioned from a study of if reparations should happen, one of how it could happen. Two years later, on June 19th, 2019, the bill was brought for its first hearing in Congress in 12 years. In HR 40, this body has a chance to both make good on its 2009 apology for enslavement and reject fair weather patriotism to say that a nation is both its credits and its debits, that if Thomas Jefferson matters, so does Sally Hemings, that if D-Day matters, so does Black Wall Street, that if Valley Forge matters, so does Fort Pillow, because the question really is not whether we will be tied to the somethings of our past, but whether we are courageous enough to be tied to the whole of it. Thank you. The bill has never reached a vote in the House of Representatives. But as protests for racial justice have taken hold across the US, so has a renewed focus on the bill. Even with recently renewed support for the bill in Congress, both Jackson Lee and Daniels say it's unlikely to pass without more public support. Gen Z and millennials have been motivating forces uh, in saying why we can't wait. And so I thought if we could do this in a sense of healing, racial divide, uh, now more than any moment in history, I believe it is appropriate, but I've always taken it seriously. I've always sought for my colleagues to take it seriously. And I've always gone to those who don't look like me, 
not in anger or anguish, but in a way of saying, you want to do this because America is better than this. Um, so since October, when this video was presented, uh, you heard in the video that there were 157 sponsors of the, of the bill as of October, 2020. Um, a few things have happened since then. The number of sponsors of the bill has increased to 173, um, co-sponsors of the bill. Uh, two of them are from the state of Wisconsin, Gwen Moore and Mark Pocan. I don't know if I'm saying his name right. Um, Scott Fitzgerald, I think maybe needless to say, is not a sponsor of the bill, um, a co-sponsor of the bill. Also, uh, Senate Bill S-1083 was introduced by Senator Cory Booker, which mirrors very closely H.R. 40. It has 12 co-sponsors, uh, not Tammy Baldwin. Um, or Ron Johnson. Um, in the last couple of months, California, the state legislature of California has passed a law, a statewide law, uh, closely modeled after HR 40. Um, again, uh, to be clear about what we're talking about, HR 40 and these other measures that I've mentioned will establish a commission to study what reparations would look like. Um, and the point is, is that it's not a settled matter what it would happen. Is it checks? Is it something else? The bill doesn't say, but it says we need a we need a, love, a, a serious conversation at a national level to confront this issue and find out how it should happen. Um, so again, there's a Senate bill, there's a, a, a House bill that's gaining more and more sponsors. Uh, California has passed a reparations uh, as pass legislation to form a reparations commission modeled after HR 40. Uh, municipalities across the country from Durham, North Carolina to Evanston, Illinois have passed um, um, municipal ordinances um, uh, that enact some form of reparations or another and those local bills take even greater different kinds of forms. Um, and uh, universities, uh, most notably Georgetown University, has embarked upon policies of uh, searching in its past um, for, um, in, the, in the case of Georgetown, the owners, uh, the, the, the university owned slaves and the sale of those slaves actually allowed the university to continue to exist. So that university is uh, seeking to make amends to the descendants of those people. The point is, is that, um, this is an idea that's uh, gaining traction and that there are many different examples out there of how it could look. Um, another thing that I think is important to say is that the, the guy says, uh, one of the, the people in the video said, it's not a jobs bill. Um, one of the important things about reparations or the idea of reparations is that it's about making, making amends for uh, years of racial injustice and sin and, and about healing. And uh, next, uh, Mike is going to talk about that idea, about how we connect that idea um, to our Catholic faith and the sacrament of re reconciliation. So pass it over to Mike, if I can get my, here we go. You're muted, Mike. I think that's better, correct? Um, I know we shouldn't read frames of PowerPoints, uh, but there were a couple uh, paragraphs from the most recent Catechism of the Catholic Church um, that, in, that both involve, well, they're talking about reconciliation. Um, and the, I think we, we understand them both, but it's good to be reminded. Um, so to get close to God, to return, um, we talk about that as conversion and an aspect of that is repentance um, to admit sinfulness and uh, to um, be resolved that we will try not to keep doing 
what we've been doing. So uh, it looks at the past and it looks, of course, at the present, how we want to change, but how we hope to continue to change. Um, and we, we're grateful for God's mercy that makes that possible. Um, so then th the second point that, that is made is that um, the, the Penitence Act is repentance, confession, and a disclosure of sin. Um, and then comes the phrase, the intention to make reparation. Um, so it's, uh, I always thought it was just how many Our Fathers and Hail Marys uh, that we were given as our penance, but of course, um, maybe as children, but as adults, <laughs> we know that uh, we have to see the world as it really is. Um, and we're called that the kingdom of God is what we're trying to bring, um, to bring it closer to the kingdom by making reparations. Um, so those are just a couple paragraphs. They're rich from the, uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Um, and they really, you know, the whole emphasis is not to forget the social aspect um, of sinfulness and of uh, reparation. Um, it's never just enough to think about our, uh, our singular, our singular, our, you know, our uh, personal uh, salvation, since salvation comes um, to the community, um, to the body. So I think you've got that in your own packets, but uh, so pardon me for reading part of it. So shall we move on? We'll talk about this in our small groups if you choose to. Okay, so um, next we're gonna break into small groups um, for some uh, discussion. And to guide your discussion, we have these four questions prepared. Um, uh, first, when thinking about reparations, what are you trying to wrap your head around when it comes to this issue? Number two, how might reparations be connected to the sacrament of reconciliation? Three, how might re reparations be a divine gift? Number four, and think, and this one, think back to the opening prayer uh, of Father Massingale's words about my leg of the race. How can I behave differently to foster this right relationship? And what actions can we take as a parish? And so Mary is going to break us. Oh, uh, before we break into groups, at the beginning, when you get into your groups, please, uh, at the beginning of the conversation, appoint one person. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't matter who, but that will report back some, some points uh, to the whole group. It's a large group, so we want to make sure everybody's voice is heard. Um, and then um, as a time check, we want to get everybody stick to the 8 p.m. thing. So we're going to give about 15 minutes for this discussion. Um, and the chat is open. Um, if It'll be in different places depending on how you have your screen, but your chat will be open. And I'm going to post the questions in the chat now. I think that worked. So the questions are in the chat. The questions will be there when you uh, break into your small groups. And so you have about 15 minutes to discuss these four questions and then report, uh, uh, report back. So Mary, you gonna break us up? I'm gonna All break right, and I just wanted to add, Chris, I just wanna add that um, introduce yourselves first. So you kind of get a handle of who's in your group um, and name your parish. Okay, ready to go to small groups. Here we go, everybody. Just um, hit the join button when you're asked to do so. How do you?
Okay, welcome back, everybody. I hope you all um, had productive discussion. Um, what we'd like to do now is, again, I don't want to put the, the burden on the person that was designated as the reporter. I think the group is small enough where we could all kind of share. Um, so if, if you were designated as the reporter, don't feel like you have to be the one to report every single thing that's said, but maybe it's just a good way to start hearing the perspectives of each of the groups to if somebody from each group wants to volunteer to share uh, a thing or two uh, that they heard in the group that struck them. Um, and then we can open it up for discussion. So we have about 15 more minutes of this large group discussion um, before we talk about the invitation to action. So uh, any, again, the, whichever group reporter wants to uh, speak, and then after that, we'll open it up to open discussion. Um, yeah. Margaret, we forgot to, Chris, to, to uh, uh, designate somebody. Um, we did too. We had a great group, Father Peter Patrick, and uh, let's see, and Brenda. Brenda, where are you? I'm uh, here. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. And Margaret, I don't know. Yes. Margaret, you're the veteran um, oh. facing racism person. Would you like to report? Um, gee, I didn't take notes because you were so busy taking notes. Um, well, why don't, we I just, about why don't I just give him my notes? Actually, um, Mike has this wonderful thing that he uses um, when he wants to talk to people when he wants to talk to people about um, the issues of racism that are facing us. And he said that he has a little card where he, um, he knows that Black Lives Matter is um, very important right now. And we all, we mentioned that, that this is a time to, um, to move on this, this, big problem. And um, we can't do business as usual. We have to pay attention to what he called the four P's that are affecting that racism affects people, the black people, um, poverty, prejudice, prison, and police violence. And those are things that we have to start working on. And um, as Christians, we should work on it. And Reparations should be more than just um, money. We felt that everybody is responsible for um, what happened before us and we should um, <laughs> I can't remember what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> responsible for what happened before us and as Christians we should do that work. And I was really impressed with something Brenda said. She said, we're onlookers um, because I mean, we, we can't help but see that 57 cents is what an African-American makes an hour for every dollar a white person makes. And for every thousand dollars, a white family saves, a black family saves, $62. So there's no accumulation of wealth at all. Um, so, um, and I think people made the good point that Father Peter Patrick was really stressing uh, the need for dialogue that's, that will end up in healing rather than denial. Um, and I think that's true. I think sometimes we feel guilty about the whole situation. Um, I suppose some of that guilt has to do with the fact we're not really doing too much except feeling bad. So um, this is, I think, a way to push us forward. Um, one thing that occurred to me, once this committee starts to actually work, it would really be good if we knew as they progressed what their ideas are and what they're proposing because it would stimulate conversation 
so that this doesn't get just dumped into Congress, which is dysfunctional, where every Democrat says good idea and every Republican says never. <laughs> um, so this could be a great platform for also, um, you know, it, it's really digging deep with a lot of things we just heard. So. I could go ahead and, and speak for our group. And so if our group back me up if I missed something, please. Um, you know, we, we um, <clears throat> the, the thoughts that were put forward is reparations are, are really the only thing that will help us move forward because the history of repression keeps us from having a healthy society. Uh, and the issue is too large to ignore. Something has to be done. Uh, and then was also mentioned that reparations should be considered to be a divine gift. This is somehow an idea that can really, if we put our, our hearts and souls into it, could, could end up being the healing thing that would need to happen. So, Joel or anyone else, anything? I thought a really good point was that uh, the leaders of these movements that have been happening of late, um, those people are divine gifts. They really, um, I thought that was a very, very good point that was made. Uh, and this is our opportunity. Our divine gift is the, the grace to know that we need to do something and whatever, whatever that might be. So those are some, some thoughts from our group too. I could uh, speak for our group. I just jotted some things down that, that we, we got through the first two items and, and each of us had some, some ideas and, and haven't really woven them together, <laughs> sort of individual uh, ideas from each of us on those. But uh, the first one about wrapping our heads around the idea of, of reparations, a um, couple of us really saw that question as being what kind of hurdles are there uh, even to addressing this topic. And, and um, one of them is that the word reparations itself just has such a, co a negative connotation uh, from history that um, when it's been applied as uh, you know, retribution after a war that it's, uh, um, it, it, it rarely produces any kind of positive result. Um, another is that um, the, uh, as, as primarily white people as we are in this committee that that um, uh, there uh, that the objection um, a, a sort of natural objection can possibly uh, be more easily overcome if we look at it through a Catholic perspective and we've already gotten some ideas um, uh, given to us about uh, potentially thinking of this in in sort of Catholic language that we can understand um, and another idea was that uh, we, and kind of an, an impediment to just going ahead with reparations is that we haven't really stopped doing the harm for which reparations are, are uh, you know, seen as a payment. Um, so that there's a lot of work to do um, in, it, obviously with, with modern issues that have been brought up, the four Ps and, and, and other things. Um, and another uh, was that just imagining, trying to imagine how reparations would happen is a challenging concept. And part of it is uh, addressing inequities that are part of our history and that um, learning the history of, of racial inequities and, and um, learning them in a, a balanced and, and um, accurate way is, is something that hasn't been done much. Obviously, uh, history can be taught from all manner of, of angles. And uh, the, the fact that we don't have a cultural history of having been taught that history um, in, in a complete and, and accurate way is, is a, a challenge. Um, moving on to the second item about uh, how how can it be a divine gift? Um, one is that, that just, just the very simple concept that, that um, as, as, as we are moving into Lent, that uh, um, perhaps we're at a time of year that, that it's, it's easier to look 
at this as a divine gift and 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 just simply that that uh giving giving is is more satisfying than receiving um as a, uh, a kind of very basic concept um next that um there is a that reconciliation which we which is of course one of our sacraments is is a humbling process and a healing process and that if we think of reparations you know whether you know individually or as a as a community as as kind of a community reconciliation that that uh, is is a, a way that that we can see it as a divine gift and that um that we really are making amends um that uh, this is related to uh, reconciliation but again looking at the practical um connection with history that we're not doing this as charity or as um as an extension of um of of social programs that that would otherwise that otherwise are seem just uh, but that we are truly making amends for history, and um, and then that our forgiveness, our sense of forgiveness, only comes uh, when we actually ask for it. So so that this would be a way for us individually and as a community to be asking for forgiveness would be uh, for us to be open to the idea of reparations and um, be open for for projects related to it to, to go forward. I can start out with some of um, the thoughts that came out in our group, um, but please, Chris and Leah and Mary, jump in. <laughs> um, so one of the things that um, we talked about was that, or that was brought up was that actually in this time and place with the pandemic, it was, it, it kind of gave, has given us some more um, opportunity to, to focus on it and learn more. And, um, you know, we, in some ways have like slowed down in, in activities. So we had more opportunity to, to, um, dig deeper, I guess. And, um, and we all agreed, this sounds like a, an overwhelming task. And, and um, it'll be, you know, interesting to, to find, you know, to hear what the recommendations are. Um, but we talked about how it, it's a, since it's, it's been, it's so deeply rooted, the, you know, the systemic racism and the, the systems, the systems are so deeply rooted that it almost um, is going to require something drastic in order to, to move forward and drastic. And then it was also pointed out drastic, but yet so basic that, you know, the systems have been systematically funneling wealth away from wealth and opportunity away from um, black individuals that you know it's just basic that you know it, it needs to be reparations need to be made so um, and then also that in terms of um, reconciliation that this whole, um, the commission is kind of like that first step of an examination of con conscience. You know, like we have to all each look at ourselves and as a country, we need to look at ourselves and figure out, you know, where, where are, where is my brokenness and my um, fault in this? And, um, and then the, the, um, you know, the commission will give us some of the the uh, ways that we can do our do our penance, kind of, or you know, um, start the reparations. Um, any what? Anything else? Group. So is that all the groups or is there someone else I want to share? Obviously, 
I think was there another group that didn't that didn't share? Might have been everybody. Does anybody? I mean, and so at this point, um, we have I'm a few sorry, minutes. Chris. Oh, there, there is another group that. Didn't okay, there you go. I knew it. <laughs> and I and I'm I was trusting that somebody else would speak up, but Sam gave us a a real good thought at the end of our group. But I've been sitting here and I we were talking about how we as a parish need to work on this reparation. And as I'm sitting here thinking about it, I'm thinking by becoming a choice parish, a school, we are now allowing, I mean, we are encouraging, we are encouraging children to participate in our wonderful education program that we hear about here at St. Sebastian. So in, in some ways, maybe that's a step towards reparation. Um, but Sam, I think you should be saying what it was that you, the comment that you made at the end about reparation. Something about. Yeah. Well, I was just quite honestly um, responding to John's thought when he said <laughs> that um, he was, oh, now I don't know how to put it well. He was not comfortable with the idea of a finite debt and paying back and then we're done and we go on. And I suggested that we think of it as starting to right a wrong because then you don't, you're starting to, you don't just do a little bit and walk away. And I also, you know, with the comments that other people in the group about where things had been going on, mentioned that within our parish, Wauwatosa is within our parish. And at one time I thought Wauwatosa stretched further east and encompassed much more of our parish. Up until 1967, there were statutes in Wauwatosa that people who were non-white could not own, rent, or make use of land, of real estate within Wauwatosa. This is within our lifetimes. And I, I'm having trouble going back to my thoughts before because you have all brought me so many more interesting new thoughts since then. But um, I was struck by what people were saying about, you know, in addition to John saying he didn't think it should be something finite because we all agreed that prejudice and bias and disadvantage are, are ongoing. And um, the words I just heard were about it being part of the system, a systemic problem. Um, I think somehow reparations need to be structured. So to go back to the systemic problem and to John's statement about, we don't just pay a debt and walk away. Reparation should be in some way that it's not a one-time thing, but since there's institutional problems, we need to perhaps use this money from this bill, if it passes, to create some institutional systems of overcoming these problems, such as fostering perhaps savings and loans in disadvantaged areas to offset the problem of redlining. It's just one thought of putting some government money into establishing small savings and loans in disadvantaged areas. Um, but listening to everybody thinking and sharing, the other thing I did think is that even if we didn't actively pursue uh, prejudiced systems, we benefited from them unfairly and so shouldn't that put an impetus on us to say to recognize that we've benefited unfairly and therefore we have an obligation to pursue justice we may not have done this ourselves but we benefited so we still have an obligation and 
in like ethics, they often make a distinction between the guilty party and the responsible party. You know, we weren't there to own slaves, but as you say, Sam, we are the uh, um, the inheritors of the wealth that was produced. So we are responsible in that sense. Um, sorry, I want to, the discussion, I feel like it's just beginning, but I wanted to pause here uh, and, and give an opportunity. Um, if you are so, and let me share my screen again. So what, what we wanted to do is not just have a discussion, but also um, give an opportunity, however small, to take action. So what, what I'm going to do right now is I'm sharing a link to the chat. Um, and what the link is to uh, is to um, an ACLU uh, petition that if you put in your information, and I think I couldn't get it to not show Mike's information. So if you follow the link, I'm pretty sure everybody will have Mike's address so we can all visit him later. Um, Just take anyhow, it uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry, Mike, I couldn't take, I, and I don't know if it's gonna show up if, you, if everybody follows the link. I don't care. That's okay. In any case. Um, it's, it's to urge your member of Congress to um, support HR 40. For many of us who live in the city of Milwaukee in Gwen Moore's district, she already supports it. It never hurts to hear from uh, their, their constituents that we're, that we're serious. Um, if you live in uh, Scott Fitzgerald's district, you know, maybe it, you're shouting into a, a void, but it doesn't hurt to, to make your voice heard. Um, there's certainly no pressure that you do this, that you click the link and do it now, but I did want to pause and give everybody the opportunity to do it if they felt like it. And so what, if you click the, and, um, I'm going to stop talking I in just, a second. I just clicked it and it does not have Mike's name on it. So oh, okay. it'll be a clean sheet and you can You're, just. So is everybody seeing my screen? So this is what it will look like. Um, if you follow, is everybody seeing this, um, ACLU reparations thing? Okay, so if you click the link, um, if you feel so moved, it has this text that I'm not gonna go through now, basically supporting HR 40. You fill in your information um, and then click send message. I should also note that you may wanna, depending on your uh, preference, you may wanna uncheck these um, to sign up for emails and um, to call or text you, you can uncheck those. I've signed it and I haven't, I unchecked those. I haven't gotten anything, uh, mail or call or otherwise. Um, and so I did want to pause the conversation for a moment to allow people to do that. Um, and, and promise I'll be quiet. So if anybody is feeling like doing it and they're having like, um, technical difficulties, we'll leave the conversation quiet for a moment. And if you need help, um, you can ask for it. So we'll give a few minutes and then we'll return to the discussion after that. And then I think this link was sort of the beginning of, of the idea. Like this could be something, but nobody's gonna sign it unless we have discussion and some learning about it. So that's where this evolved from. Uh, unless Leah and Mike, you have a different origin story. <laughs> My origin story is you, Chris. I'd never heard of it until Chris Dwyer. <laughs> We're kind of a small committee, John. We didn't intend to be. Um, we thought maybe the people that were working on the election on voter registration might jump in, but uh, we remain a small group. Um, and actually any ideas that anybody has that they wanna throw our way, um, we would like to you know, continue to explore issues and share with the bigger group. This, this was very, it's just, was, I just wanted to take the opportunity to say it was very good and very informative and educational. So thank you. I know we're not done yet, but thank you for putting it all together. I, I, I learned a lot. Thank you. Well, and I'll, I'll just, am I on? No. Yeah, you we can, can hear you. Okay. I'm not flashing. Oh, there I am. Um, I have a neighbor who, who couldn't come tonight, but wants the information. I have a cousin in St. Louis who said, you know, I really don't know anything about it. Let me know what you find out. So, I mean, I, I think there is an opportunity to, to grow this, so. Yeah. I just um, wanna, 
I just want to mention an article that was in the Wall Street Journal last Saturday. I don't know if any of you read it, but it's really a good article. The title of it is, Can Catholic Social Teaching Unite a Divided America? And it's exactly what we're talking about. So if you can get your hands on it, try to read it. Who's the author, Brenda? Francis X. Roca. Can you say the title again? Can Catholic Social Teaching Unite a Divided America? Was that R-O-C-C-A? Yes. I, uh, I just put the link in the chat. So I, I, I quickly Googled it and okay. put the link in the chat so you can Great. follow that one too. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess if there's no, I think the, the conversation can continue. I think there's sounds like there's not that many um, technical questions on people that want to fill out the, the petition now, but can't. So um, we'll make sure to email, maybe it's a good idea for us to email all the materials out again, um, along with some of the other links and, and things that people have shared in the chat. I know some other, uh, some other interesting things were shared. So we'll share that after, um, but for now, um, I think maybe the best thing is to, so again, you'll have an opportunity to do the, um, the petition later if you want, but I think we can use the next, the, the next few minutes or so until eight, eight o'clock to talk about uh, some things that can be done um, besides this bill um, to make amends, uh, to do reparations on a national level, on a personal level, on a parish level. Um, or any other thoughts or reflections that people have. I think we have an open some time for open discussion. I heard such good things said by uh, what people reported and what our people in our group said that I feel, um, you know, one of the things we, in that prayer that uh, Leah read for us uh, was the strength to I forget the wording, but it was the strength to reach out and do something sort of. Um, and I think that uh, I do feel that I was strengthened by what I heard to be, uh, to be able to be more proactive. Um, so thanks everybody. Um, I, I also think that this is something that we should definitely share with the larger facing racism group so that everybody that wasn't, that is interested in this whole movement is, is aware of this. I think that that's something that we should definitely uh, share with everybody that's in the group. I don't know, one thing to, uh... Most of you, you are educators, and um, you know, I don't know how much uh, about the history of what country is being taught in the schools, and I, I feel so kind of like a rush from my back about you know the Black History Month. We are not supposed to be learning about the African American only one month, and if we're told we don't know our history, if we're told we don't teach our children about the history of our country, where we are coming from then we are not planning for them for the future. And if at all we can be able to advocate much to be one of you know, the school curriculum, to be taught in schools, these children to learn where they are coming from, where we are coming from, then we can be able to prepare them for the future. They are able to handle that other than just after seeing like protest happening, something, someone has been shot. That's when we are just moved our emotions. You're not supposed to be moved by emotions. It's, you're supposed to be moved by love. And if at all we are not advocating for that, maybe some of you, you are retired educators, but still from this perspective, what we are doing right now is not just for the time being, but we are trying to teach the next generation and to live in harmony and in love with each other. You know, the older I get, the more I realize that it's for the next generation. Um, Maggie, you're an educator too, and you've got grandchildren, tons of them. Um, you know, now we're looking at, they are gonna pick up 
whatever it is when runners pass something on. <laughs> so they are the ones, as Father Peter Patrick says, that we need to equip as best we can um, for what they're going to do. Um, somebody said, I said to somebody, well, the nice thing about the next generation, I bet they won't be so polarized as we are. And they said, well, why do you think that? <laughs> Don't you think they're hearing their parents' views? Um, you know, so uh, there's, we can give them something. And Father Peter Patrick suggests that we could give them, um, you know, a great deal, including the message of love. So, so if I can um, just make a comment here, again, I'm, I'm not a member of your parish, but I just want to say how impressed I am by the work that you're doing. We are just at the very beginning of starting a, a racial equity group at um, our parish in West Bend. But one of the things that has, has um, really occurred to me lately is kind of an extension of the voter registration work you did is the need for us to um, stand up to the voter suppression activities that are going. There are a hundred bills pending right now across the country in virtually every state, if not every state, to restrict um, voting by mail to, you know, in Wisconsin, as you're probably aware, to change the way um, uh, the elect our electoral college representatives are selected, you know, so basically the Republicans can control that too. And I think it, you know, it's just so ironic that, you know, on the one hand, we're talking about reparations. And on the other hand, we have half the country that's trying to find more ways to um, disenfranchise and, and harm uh, people of color. So, um, you know, the, the, the work is not done by any means. And I just think we have to be so vigilant around this to try to maintain, um, you know, some semblance of equity going forward, um, even as we're trying to uh, repair the damage going backwards. Great, I think that I, I really like what you say. And I think it goes back to something Doug said is that we're still like, we're going to make amends and it's still, we're still sinning. The, 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 sin, the sin is still going on, but it really reminds me of like, the best, the times when I need to go to the sacrament of confession the most is when I feel like I'm, you know, when I know the ones that I need the sacrament for, when I need God for, are the ones that I know that I'm not gonna uh, be able to, to fix it on my own. Um, I'm, I'm going to probably do that sin again. Um, and I think that is a very powerful analogy for uh, where we are. Um, that unless we do something and we do something concrete, that to make amends, to repair the relationship, both in our individual lives of sin and redemption and in our societal life, um, it's very unlikely that that sin is going to stop happening unless we, um, and that's one of the beauties of that, of that sacrament that they're like, whether it's 10 Hail Marys or something more significant, it's like, you have to do something to, to make up for it. Um, I think that's extremely powerful. Anyway, Thank what you. you said made me think of that. Um, I'm having two completely divergent thoughts here. And um, one of them is that as a member of the prayer group, I want to thank Leah for writing the prayer she read to us and suggest that this is perhaps an opportunity for all of us to think about praying by doing. And the other thought I'm having is that people, and we are speaking largely of people that look just like us, are the ones who are coming up with all of these bills and schemes to suppress another group that they find threatening because they are going to, quote, take some of the authority that we have unjustly uh, misused. But what we fail to recognize is that abuse in a very 
significant way it hurts not just the abused but the abuser and when we let this sort of thing go on we are also damaging ourselves and our children and that it's a fairly short step from suppressing and abusing one group to suppressing and abusing another group and so we should all be thinking now i'm half german and i'm looking at the holocaust and it wasn't just jews who were oppressed and imprisoned and murdered i'm thinking we should all be very threatened by the rise in dishonesty and authoritarianism in this country and we should be protecting our neighbors because we are also protecting ourselves and our children's heritage. So prayer by action and some enlightened self-interest both apply here. <laughs> Before we go, I think we should also just take a look around what's going on in our parishes um, and give ourselves or give our fellow parishioners credit for the good work that is being done that um that does follow the philosophy of of um the spirit of reparations even if it isn't uh, technically you know it, it, an actual act of reparations i mean the the uh the work that's done with our our saint vincent de paul uh groups and, and, and our food pantry and, and you know, things that are going on um, that are contributed to by our parish members. Um, we should take a look and, and see what, what sort of foundations we already have going that, um, that really meet the, the, uh, the spirit, if not all of the exact criteria of, uh, of, of, of the I guess that you know the spirit of, of reparations, the, the idea of of um, of giving back and and trying to make the situation in our neighborhoods uh, more just. So some of that work is already being done. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well said. I think everybody. I thank you so much for sharing. I, I wish we could go on and on, uh, and I you know there's a lot more to say um, and a lot more to learn. But it's eight o'clock, so um, I think we should officially conclude and say thank you so everybody so very much for sharing your evening um, on behalf of everybody in our group. I know that I took a lot, got a lot out of all your thoughts and your, your reflections and wisdom. So I really appreciate it. Um, and I'll certainly, unless there's any other final housekeeping things, I will um, certainly send out all the materials, um, um, anything that's, I'll save the chat, get stuff from the chat and share that out and all the links to the videos and the articles that were shared and that were mentioned. Can I just Thank say a you. quick thing? Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. It was Thank wonderful, you. Chris. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Good job, Chris. Wonderful.